What we've just seen is a new type of failure of a mechanical system. So up to now, we've been looking at failure of mechanical systems primarily by computing their stresses and checking them against the yield stresses. But what we've just seen is something what is known as a geometric failure of a system. It's sometimes known as a buckling failure. And yielding isn't even necessary for this to occur. And what I'd like to do is develop the, the the necessary machinery to analyze these types of failures uh, of mechanical systems. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to start fairly simple. First, we'll try and uh, review a little bit of background on potential energy that will allow us to uh, have a system of analysis for these types of systems. But then we'll move on to simple rigid systems, and eventually we'll get to the case that we just observed, which is the buckling of flexible or deformable systems, which is known as oil or buckling of, of columns or, or beams. So that, that's the game plan here. To start with, let me rem let's remind ourselves about a few things from elementary physics and potential energy ideas. So let's think about a simple mechanical system where we have a weight P that's sitting on top of a spring with spring constant K. And so I'll measure distance vertically from the bottom of the support of the spring by the coordinate Z. And so the spring will have some unstrained length, we'll call it Z naught. And when I place the weight on top of the spring, the spring is gonna compress a certain amount and we'll call that delta. So delta is the motion of the weight as it moves down. Now. For equilibrium of this system, we know that the spring constant times the deflection delta minus p has to equal zero, so that's force equilibrium in the z direction. And we can re-express this equilibrium equation using the notion of potentials. First of all, note that the, the force on the spring, which is p, is due to gravity, and so there's a potential for gravity, and that's just simply going to be the weight times its position vertically, so p times z. And note that what we mean by potential is that it's a function whose negative derivative is going to give us the force. So in this case here, the, the negative gradient of, of pi g with respect to z is going to give us uh, minus p. So that gives us the force, and it's a, there's a minus sign because the force is going in the downward direction. Uh, now. The spring also has a potential, and that's the strain energy stored in the spring. So the strain energy stored in the spring is 1 half k times z minus z naught. So z naught is the reference length of the spring squared. And notice that if I take the negative derivative of the potential with respect to z, I get k z minus z naught. And z minus z naught is just simply delta. So this gives us the force in this system. Now, the total potential of the system is the sum of the two potentials, so the gravitational potential, the potential of the load, plus the potential of the spring. And the total force acting is going to be minus the derivative of pi total with respect to z. And the total force acting on the system has to be equal to zero for equilibrium. So this is just simply another way of writing down the equilibrium condition is just simply to say that the potential energy, the total potential energy of the system has to be stationary, so its derivative needs to be equal to zero. Uh, and this is the notion of, of stationary potential energy, and it always holds for conservative systems. Okay, so this, this is the first step to understanding stability and, uh, of a mechanical system. Now, to go a little bit further, let's consider a particular system. So suppose I have a point mass pendulum. Uh, so I have a rigid rod of length L. It's uh, attached to a frictionless pivot on one end, and on the other end there's a mass M. And there's a gravitational field, let's say G, pointing downwards. And the pendulum can be at any angle theta, so it can be swinging in the dynamic case. But in equilibrium, uh, theta will be some kind of fixed value. So let's try and figure out what that is. And the potential energy, first of all, we can of the pendulum is going to be mgl times 1 minus cosine theta. So L 1 minus cosine theta is just simply the distance vertically from where the pendulum would be if it were hanging straight down. And we multiply that by mg. And that gives us the potential. So the torque acting on the pendulum, well, that's the negative gradient of pi with respect to theta. That's going to be minus mgl sine theta, where I've taken the, the torque to be positive in the counterclockwise direction here. Okay. Now, uh, 
for equilibrium, the torque, the total torque needs to be equal to zero. So if I set this expression here equal to zero, there are two values of theta that will satisfy the equation, t equals zero. One is theta equals zero, which is sort of the obvious equilibrium configuration. That's where the, the pendulum points straight down. But there's a second solution, that is pi or theta equals pi, and that's when the pendulum is pointing straight up. And these are two equilibrium configurations for the pendulum. One of these is stable, this one here, and this one happens to be unstable. So let's examine this in a little bit more detail. That's sort of an intuitive statement that it's going to be stable if it's hanging down and unstable if it's pointing straight up. But let's examine this in, in a bit more detail here. So let's start with the hanging straight down position. Suppose I perturb the pendulum in a pos with a positive perturbation, so we'll call that delta theta, let's say. Okay? And if I do that, then there's going to be a torque on the system. I can evaluate that from this relationship here. If I evaluate the torque, I'm going to find out that the torque is negative. So for del theta positive, so this is del theta here. So for del theta positive, I'm going to have a negative torque on the system. And so you can see that the torque that's being applied to the system, if I perturb it in the, in the positive direction, is in the negative direction. So it tries to restore the position of the pendulum to the uh, hanging straight down position. If I perturb the pendulum in, with a negative perturbation, so negative del theta, and then I evaluate what the torque on the system is, I'll find out that the torque is positive. So again, I'm going to find that I have a restoring torque on the system. It's trying to restore the state of the system to where it originally was. Okay, so And that's what we would call a stable equilibrium position of the system. So perturbations lead to restoring forces. These are forces that try and bring the system back to where you started. So theta equals zero, we would say, is a stable equilibrium of the pendulum. Now, if we look at the other equilibrium solution, so that's when theta equals pi, and let me consider a perturbation of the pendulum of positive delta theta, as drawn there. So if I do that, I'm going to find and I evaluate the torque again for, for this position. So I'm going to evaluate here for theta is equal to pi plus del theta, where del theta is some small positive number, I'm going to find out that the torque is going to be positive. And so the torque that's applied to the system when I perturb it in a positive sense is positive. And so this torque is going to try and drive the system away from the equilibrium configuration, which is theta equals pi. If I consider a negative perturbation, so del theta negative from pi, and I evaluate the torque again, I'm going to find out that the torque is negative. So I end up with a torque that moves in concert with the perturbation and tries to drive the system further away from its equilibrium position of theta equals pi. So this is what we call an unstable equilibrium. Perturbations lead to forces in the same direction as the perturbation, so they drive the system away from the equilibrium. And so the statement would be that theta equals pi is an unstable equilibrium of the system. So this is a way to understand uh, stability. Now, originally I, I started everything off with a potential energy, and if you look at these arguments about what the sign of the torque is based on the sign of the perturbation, which I did for each case, what I'm really doing is evaluating the second derivative of the potential at the equilibrium state. And so you can summarize that notion quite simply is that if the second derivative of pi with respect to del theta is positive, then I have a stable situation. If the second derivative with respect to theta is negative, then I'll have an unstable equilibrium. And if it's equal to zero, it's neutral. It's relatively easy to see where the second derivative uh, conditions come from. If we collect together all the results that we have for the different types of perturbations, we have that if I evaluate the torque at, um, at an equilibrium position plus a perturbation, and multiply that by the perturbation, then that should be negative for stability. In other words, if I have a positive perturbation, I want to have a negative torque, so something that opposes it or vice versa. So that's the condition for stability. If you have the opposite inequality, then you, you'll have an unstable system. And remember, the perturbation is a small quantity. So what I can do is, with that expression for the torque, is I can expand it out in a Taylor series. So if I do a two-term Taylor, Taylor series approximation, I'll have the torque evaluate the equilibrium position times the first derivative of the torque evaluated at the equilibrium position times the perturbation. 
and then multiply by the perturbation that I started with, and that should be negative free equilibrium. Well, the torque at equilibrium is equal to zero, and the torque itself is the negative derivative of the potential. So the derivative of the torque with respect to theta is minus the second derivative of the potential with respect to theta. So I can combine these together, and I'll have a delta del theta squared, so I can divide through by that, and so what I find out is that if the second derivative of the potential is positive, then I have stability for my system. And if I go ahead and look at the case for instability, I find out that if the second derivative is negative, then I'm going to have instability. Um, the third case that I mentioned was the neutral stability case. That's when you have a quality, and you can see what's happening there. When you have a quality for the second derivative, that just simply means that the second term of the Taylor series approximation came out to be identically equal to zero. And so really, if you want to consider stability, then you need to look at higher derivatives in the Taylor series. So saying something is neutrally stable is a little bit misleading. It just simply means you have to do a little bit more analysis to find out what's going on.